My journey, journey began right here in Newcastle. I had four sisters. The youngest was 16 years older than I was. Uh, none of them lived at home, so I was raised essentially by um, parents who were a bit older than parents, the usual parents of kids my age. And they were white, both my parents and my sisters. In fact, growing up, I thought I was white, but I had an afro. Now, you might be thinking, how could a, a young kid with an afro think he was white? Well, that's a really good question. Um, when everyone around you is white, including the people that love you, you've got to be white, right? And so, with that in mind, that's how it goes. And my, gran my father used to say, he was old enough, by the way, to serve in World War II. He used to say, when I was in the Royal Artillery, Gunnar Brewerton, 905-004, we got taken prisoners of war, but we escaped and across Europe. And I'd go first as a scout because I have olive-colored skin. I look more Italian, he'd say, look more Italian. <laughs> Trying to, you know, give us the impression that we were both the same. You believe anything when you're a kid, right? So my, my father was uh, a park keeper. So we had the um, rare opportunity of living in Jasmine Dean in the house by the stepping stones that crossed the river. Flowed down to the waterfall. It was a magical place to live, like what you'd find in a mythical story with its secret passages, secret paths, tunnels, caves, and a plethora of trees where my imagination could roam endlessly. But like most mythical stories, there was a secret. And when I was about to turn 12, the whole world began to change. And we moved from a small house in Jasmine Dean to a Queen's Court, a four-story apartment block in the city. Suddenly I was going to high school with hundreds of kids all of whom were white with a few exceptions. And when my new friends were saying, asking me why my parents were older and white, I didn't have an answer for that. Something felt off uh, and I had this feeling that something was out of place and that feeling grew and grew as time went on until someone knocked on our door. It was kooky. 16, 17 years old, a young boy, a, a distant friend of the family. He was looking for a place to stay, which was highly unusual because he'd never been to a house before. We hadn't seen him in years. But my parents said yes and didn't ask any questions. Later that day, he and I were playing soccer on a patch of grass outside the building. And out of nowhere, he said to me, do you know who your real father is? Well, I started to laugh, assuming he was talking about my older than usual parent with the olive colored skin who's Italian. <laughs> right. But then he said it again. Do you know who your real father is? I know where he's from. He's from Africa. Huh? Africa? I looked at him straight in the eye to see if he was fooling around, but he didn't blink. At first I was confused. My real dad is not my real dad? And then I was angry. How could a distant friend of the family know more about me than I did? I felt betrayed. But then there was another feeling that came over me that was far more overwhelming. And it was the feeling that I was looking in the mirror and seeing myself for the first time. And with it was a surreal sense of relief and uh, an immense sense of joy that filled my being to the core. It was as if someone had just torn open my chest and deep within was a treasure that I had not ever known was there. It was miraculous. It was a revelation. The next day, Cookie left unannounced before dawn. It was as if he was a divine messenger who'd been sent and then left I didn't say anything to my parents for a couple of weeks. I just had to let it all sink in. It was a lot to digest. But when I eventually approached them, as awkward as it was, they gracefully acquiesced to the truth. And the truth was this. The two people who I thought to be my mother and father were actually my grandparents. 
My youngest sister, who was 16 years older than me, was my mother. And my father was an African man who, from my time of birth, his whereabouts were unknown. It was a lot to digest. It was like my parents were letting go of a heavy burden. They seemed fragile, and as awkward as it was to learn that my mother was my sister, or my sister was my mother, I'm trying to figure that out. There was an even greater fire inside of me burning to find my father. But the truth was, no one really knew anything about him other than that he was from Africa, Ghana, and he'd studied at Newcastle University to become a doctor. But it didn't matter to me, you see, because now I was on the path of discovery to one day find him, or unbeknown to me at the time, find myself. Now, to put this all in perspective, this was happening at the exact same time that Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon were screening at the local cinema. <laughs> he was blowing our minds. If it was... If it was the Greek mythological god Prometheus who gave fire to humanity, then it was certainly Bruce Lee who brought the gift of martial arts to the Western world. But it wasn't just Bruce who was radically showing us a new way to see ourselves. I was discovering Muhammad Ali, who was knocking people out and saying, I'm black and I'm beautiful, while he was rhyming poetry. And so I was inspired by these two guys, and at the same time, I'm watching the TV series Roots, based on the true story of Kunta Kinte, who was a young boy, an African slave, who was trying to find his freedom. Wow, so I had a lot going on right there. With all that happening in my world, I felt the calling, and I joined my first Kung Fu class. And my first teacher was Robert Tin, and then the legendary Steve Babs, and then I call him the great Neville Ray, who's my brother. And there have been other teachers and other guides who have led me down the path who I thank. But if Kung Fu wasn't enough, I also joined the West End Boys Boxing Club. And the coach there was this guy called Phil Fowler. And he was the epitome of what you'd find in a Rocky movie, except with a Geordie accent. <laughs> Get your gloves on, kid. How where? <laughs> I've still got the accent. I can come back. I have the accent. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. So um, now I was... I had dedicated myself to these two rigorous, torturous disciplines that were two pillars of a gate that led to my rites of passage. The rites of passage that one day would lead me to find my father. I mean, that's what I thought as an adolescent. This is the mind of an adolescent. If I can become a champion, he'll find me. And so I started training really hard. And I started um, boxing. Uh, competing in boxing tournaments and in kung fu competitions. I was doing kung fu twice, twice a week. I was doing boxing twice a week. And on the nights I wasn't training in the classes, I was at home practicing what I'd learned in my bedroom. It was rigorous. It was torturous. I quit so many times, but then I just kept going and going and going. It was so hard. But after, after a little while, I become what they say the young phenomena. The kid that one day is going to make it. You know, like they say in the movie, one day you're going to make a kid. So that was me. And when I was 17, I moved to London to follow my career as a champion. I tried to be a champion. And I was still training in um, Kung Fu, but I was also, at now, I was training at the world-famous Thomas A. Beckett Boxing Gymnasium. And I was surrounded by all these professional world champion boxers. And there were also journeymen, and there were also contenders. Every kind of species of fighter was in this gym. And it raised me to another level. But it wasn't just the martial arts that was so amazing. It was that London, there were so many people of color, and it gave me a sense of belonging. Now, I'm not saying I didn't have a sense of belonging in Newcastle, for it is my home. I loved it then, and I, loved it. I love it now. Even Muhammad Ali said, he was never loved as much as he's been loved when he came to Newcastle. That says everything. But at the time, I was in desperate need to escape. You see, I couldn't find my father after several years. And I told myself, I was so frustrated, I told myself I had to put the past behind me. Just like Kunta Kinte, who had chains on him, I had chains on me that I needed to break. 
And I um, had this anger that was coming up that was saying, to hell with you. That was a PG version. <laughs> I don't need you anymore. I, don't, I looked for you. I couldn't find you. You deserted me. In fact, I don't need anyone. All I need to do is to be a champion. That's what I will do. Then I don't have to rely on anyone. See, that was all, a lot of that was unconscious. But what it did was it would allow me, it allowed me to release him and I was able to move forward. And then I was free. And then I created a new identity. And I became the Jedi. That's my fighting name. Or the Jedi became me. And like all Jedis, the force was with me. And I start winning competition after competition after competition. I became, for example, the first nationally ranked fighter to be ranked number one three years consecutive. It was unprecedented. I won numerous British championships, numerous European championships, uh, five times world kickboxing champion. I was fighting transatlantically on both sides of the Atlantic, in the USA and the UK simultaneously, winning the Empire State. Championships, light heavyweight division, and the Bermuda International Champions, Championships, light heavyweight division. These are like prestigious events in the sport that I'm in. So they were kind of like, it was a big deal. And um, it wasn't just fighting to win. I was actually reshaping the sport in some ways and impacting it in a profound way. You see, winning to me equated to a sense of belonging. It, it equated to a sense of freedom, a sense of identity that nothing else could give me at the time. And then it stopped. I decided that I wanted to redirect my energy and go into a different path. And so I had become a father, and I moved to America. I wanted to conquer Hollywood. But I found out you don't conquer Hollywood the same way you do conquer people in a ring. And I joined this acting class called the Beverly Hills Playhouse. And there was this coach, this teacher, was this guy called Milton Katselis. And he spoke like the boxing coaches I knew. He'd say things like, you've got to leave some blood on the stage. Or if you go down, get up, wipe the dust off your gloves. If you can't see, just keep swinging. I'm like, wow, I like it here. <laughs> Beautiful. But the thing that really blew my mind was, is when he said, dare to be an artist. Huh? What? Dare to be an artist. As if being an artist was equally as challenging as being a fighter. How's that possible? But it sounded like a challenge to me. So I ventured down the road. And what I learned was, I learned that, I learned how to look at myself in a new way. And I learned that I had covered myself with layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of armor, 20-inch steel-plated, fully riveted armor, head to toe with gold cufflinks. I mean, seriously, that's what we do, right, though? When we go to battle, we, we do that so nothing can get in to hurt us. But the problem is, nothing can get in to love us either. And I realized that I had cut the search off to find my father. And now that I was a father, I wanted to find my lineage. And so I started taking more of this armor off. Dare to be an artist. Ouch. Dare to be an artist. Ouch. It's, it's weird. Trust me. And after a little while, I started searching for my father again. And it led me all the way to Africa. But it wasn't him. He wasn't there. That was devastating. I thought that... It was like the lyrics from the Eric Clapton song. You know, my father's eyes when he says, I felt like a bridge that had been washed away. That was how it felt. It was bad. But the search continued and it led me all the way back to England. But this time I thought I'd found him for sure. I even spoke with him on the phone. All the circumstances were in alignment. Right place, right time, right name. I've got it. So I wound up on his doorstep, polite and dignified, but unlike in Star Wars, when Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father, this time it was, look, I'm not your father. <laughs> he got so mad, he was raising his hand, pointed at me, Scott. I stepped up, I thought we were going to exchange blows, really. Then he froze, and we were like two deer caught in the headlamps. Frozen in time. Then I hear a little voice behind me, 
Dad, are you okay? Dad, it's my seven-year-old daughter. Oh, man, she'd been sitting in the car. I didn't want her to get her involved. She was sitting at the end of the driveway just out of sight. You see, I didn't want her to see her father being humiliated while he was looking for his father. At least that's how I felt at the time. And so I just said, honey, just, it's, we're good. Just go back to the car, please. I'll be right there. But there was something about her being there. Something about her presence that emboldened me and changed me. And I looked at the doctor. He hadn't budged an inch. He, um, he was still wearing the same grimace. I knew whatever I would do next would define me for the rest of my life. So I, I took one more step forward, took a deep breath, and pushed down all the anger. And I said, even if you are my father, I wouldn't want you to be. You don't deserve me. And then I turned and walked away. I didn't look back. Jumped in the car, hit the freeway. The voice in my head said, you don't need to find your father anymore. This time it was coming from a totally different place. It was that place again when you look in the mirror and you see yourself for the first time or see part of you for the first time that you've never seen before. I looked in the rearview mirror. My daughter says, Dad, was that your dad? I said, no. She said, good, I didn't like him. <laughs> right? Come on. I mean, like, you've been searching your whole life for your father and you finally meet him? You don't like the guy? Come on, that's life at its best. It doesn't get any better than that. Come on. We start laughing. I was laughing through my tears. I was crying, but I was free. I was free. Finally, I was free. Free of the, the need to search for my father. Free of having to know who he was. Free. I love my daughter then. Still do. She's great. If I were to leave you in this short message, I would say to you that um, this is truly the hero's journey for me. That's brought me right back to stand where I started to talk to you and share my story with you, which, for which I am so grateful. Uh, but we are all the hero. Every one of us. Every one of us is the hero. Uh, we cannot change that which we've experienced. What has happened to us, it has happened. It's in ink. It's unchangeable. But what we can do is we can change the meaning that we give to it and how we hold it within ourselves. Give yourself permission to let go of what no longer serves you. Embrace the unexpected. The world is yours. Joseph Campbell, he said, life has no meaning, none. You bring the meaning to it. The meaning of life is whatever you ascribe it to be. Being alive is the meaning. Thank you.